Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's get started. It's my great pleasure to welcome once again uh, Professor Alistair Donaldson uh, to Microsoft Research. He has been uh, uh, visiting us uh, off and on for several years now. In fact, uh, uh, just before he joined Imperial College London, he spent two months uh, with us working on uh, problems related to verification of GPU kernels. And since then, he has done many, many uh, more pieces of work on that topic and, and, and other topics at Imperial with his students. Uh, so today, he's going to tell us about some, some new work mm, unrelated to GPU verification, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Shaz, for the great introduction. I'm really pleased to hear I've been promoted to professor, which has. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, is the, what is the call you like, uh, I'm a called lecturer, which lecturer. is kind of like assistant professor. I I've heard that in the US, lecturer is really not particularly uh, prestigious. Is that true? I don't think there's a lecturer. So they're talking about changing um, Imperial to talk about, to use the US names, which maybe is a good thing. But we have this thing called reader, which is like associate professor. I think that's such a cool thing, and so I would love to be reader sometime. So I hope they make the changes after I become reader, so I can <laughs> be a reader. Okay, so the work I'm going to present is joint work with my PhD student, Paul Thompson, and also my postdoc, Adam Betts. But the work is really, has really been led by Paul, so Paul has spent a huge amount of time on, on this study. So it's, a, it's a, an empirical study about systematic concurrency testing methods based on schedule bounding. I'll explain shortly what those methods are. Many of them were developed here at Microsoft Research. So the background is that in Paul's PhD, he's interested in looking at advanced techniques for doing systematic concurrency testing, looking at new algorithms and heuristics for bug finding. And doing this quite practical work requires significant empirical evaluation to make sense of, of whether the techniques are working or not. So Paul spent a huge amount of time building up a set of benchmarks. And this benchmark gathering is very, very time consuming. So it involves huge amount of time spent on messing around with make files, getting things to build on certain versions of Linux, trying to then remodel parts of applications so that they're amenable to the testing method under consideration. Really, a huge amount of work is involved in this. So we had the idea that we would like to, I guess, get some more money's worth for our effort, or Paul should get more money's worth for his effort. So before starting to really look at brand new techniques and evaluating them, why not take the existing techniques that we have read about and that we have been inspired by and try and do a, a very objective evaluation of those techniques on the Concurrent be concurrency benchmarks that are open source that people are using in prior work and in related work on concurrency testing. And I think in the end, this led to a pretty interesting study. We had a paper this year at the Principles and Practice of Parallel Programming Conference, which Paul presented. And I was delighted that Paul won the Best Student Paper Award for this, for this work. <coughs> so the study is completely reproducible. If you, go to, if, you, if you search for the study online, you'll find our web page. There's a virtual machine where you can get all of the benchmarks, all of the tools, and you, there are scripts to actually rerun the experiments. So we hope that this could be useful to researchers in future in, in evaluating their methods. So the, the motivation for systematic concurrency testing is that, as we all know, concurrency bugs are horrible because um, they, a concurrency bug may manifest non-deterministically, rarely, and may be hard to reproduce. The key thing is that these bugs are dependent on the schedule of threads. And by a concurrency bug, I specifically mean a bug that may or may not manifest according to the way threads are scheduled. So a bug that would always occur would not, to my mind, be a concurrency bug, even if it's in a concurrent program. I would say a bug is a concurrency bug if whether or not it manifests depends upon the interleaving of threads. And in our study, we consider crashes and assertion failures to be bugs. And we don't consider data races to be bugs. I will come back to that point later on. So we're talking about a concurrent program that runs until either it crashes, say with a segmentation fault, or some assertion fails. And the assertions are either there in our benchmarks, or we've added these assertions because the benchmarks perhaps contained output checking code, which we've then replaced with assertions. Systematic concurrency testing is a pretty simple idea in, in principle. The idea is you have a concurrent program and a fixed input to that program, so one test input. And furthermore, the concurrent program is assumed to be deterministic. So the program should not exhibit randomization. The program should not be doing things like reading from the network and getting data values that are not inside the program. So it should be a closed program. 
There are methods for coping with non-determinism by modeling and systematically exploring non-determinism. We didn't look at that in this work. So in this case, we're talking about a deterministic <coughs> concurrent program with the exception of the thread scheduler, which of course is non-deterministic. So having this fixed input program, then the OS scheduler would usually be responsible for scheduling the threads of this program. And a systematic concurrency testing tool, or SCT tool, sits in between the OS scheduler and the program, takes control of the scheduler, and determines the order in which threads are scheduled. And this means that it's possible to repeatedly execute the program, controlling the schedules that are explored, and to potentially enumerate thread schedules. And if the program is guaranteed to terminate for any thread schedule, then in theory, it's possible to enumerate all of the schedules of the program on this input. Of course, in practice, for significantly sized programs, this is not feasible. There would be a vast space of schedules. So um, while every schedule would be considered in the limit, in practice, the idea here is to try to find bugs in the program through the systematic method. So there are a number of tools that have implemented systematic concurrency testing. And I would say the two best known tools are Verisoft and Chess. So Verisoft was developed by Patrice Goffar when he was at Bell Labs. Uh, he's now, now at MSR. And the, the chess tool was developed by, by colleagues at MSR here, and, and so I guess some of their interns. And um, yeah, I think that, that both of these tools have had quite some impact in finding bugs in, in real world concurrent programs. So the basic idea of SCT then is if we consider the space of schedules as a tree. So from some initial state, a thread runs, uh, makes an instruction, makes another instruction. And then there are, we get to a point where there are several options of which thread could be scheduled next. So here, T1, T2, or T3 could be scheduled. So the systematic concurrency tester makes a decision about which thread to schedule, in this case, T1. And then T2 or T3 could be scheduled. So T1 is now blocked. The tool considers T2. And then this leads to um, termination. So this is a terminal schedule. And then these dotted circles are unexplored schedules. So these are schedule prefixes which demand more exploration. Okay, so this terminal schedule we can refer to as T1, 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 T2, because we have a fixed input and the only non-determinism comes from the scheduler. This sequence of thread IDs precisely characterizes the states reached during this schedule. And then we have these unexplored schedule prefixes. So T1, 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 T3, which is where we get down to the bottom left, um, where, where we get to this node here. Okay, and then T1, T1, T2, T1, T1, T3. These can be explored in future executions. So then we might look at this execution next, which would then give rise to, you know, we would have now two terminal schedules explored and then a bunch more unexplored schedules. So the, the really good thing about systematic concurrency testing is that it's relatively easy to apply it to real programs. What you have to do is essentially make a concurrency unit test for your program. That, that may not be trivial, and in our study we actually devoted quite some attention to discussing the challenges associated with doing that. But if you can get this concurrency unit test, you then can run SCT fully automatically. There's no need for any sort of static analysis or invariance or anything like that. You just run, and if you do find a bug, you can then reproduce that bug to your heart's content in order to debug the problem. You don't get any false alarms because you're really executing the program. And if it's possible to execute the program in it, all schedules up to some bound, and we will talk I'll talk later in the presentation about schedule bounds, then you can get a bounded guarantee of the program's correctness on this test input. That bounded guarantee may be useful. The problem is, though, that concurrency bugs may still be very hard to find because the schedule space is so vast. I, I presume this is all making sense so far? Yeah? OK. So there are a couple of standard optimizations which you can do. First is reducing the scheduling points to visible operations. This was something that the Verifast, uh, the, the Verisoft technique, sorry, not the separation logic Verifast tool, um, did from the start. So you schedule only at operations that could be visible to other threads, shared memory accesses, lock, unlock operations, etc. The observation being that invisible operations cannot influence other threads until a visible operation occurs. The chess tool schedules only at synchronization operations. So rather than scheduling at every read and write, you schedule only at thread create, thread join, lock, and unlock. And if you guarantee detecting data races and flagging them up as bugs, then you're guaranteed not to miss any bugs if you employ this sort of reduction. So both of these are forms of partial order reduction. And then there's a method called dynamic partial order reduction from Flanagan and Gofar in Popol 2005, which reduces search based on happens before relations and based on detecting conflicts during execution. So these are all appealing reduction methods because they're sound in the sense that they don't miss any bugs. Okay. However, if we're willing to potentially miss bugs, then we can do something 
more drastic, and, but potentially much simpler and more useful, which is schedule binding. So the idea is as follows. There is a hypothesis that realistic concurrency bugs don't require too many context switches to manifest. So of course, we could sit down together right now and we could write a concurrent program that will only crash <laughs> if 17 threads interleave in one particular order, right? But no programs like that actually exist, okay? So I could, I could be convinced that there may be programs that require, say, six or seven interleavings in, in some strange order, um, but, but this seems to be rare. Most concurrency bugs appear to be exposable using only a small number of context switches. So this motivates the idea of restricting search to only schedules that, that do a certain bounded number of context switches. This can drastically reduce the schedule space. And if this hypothesis about concurrency bugs is true, it can, hope it can still be useful in finding bugs and potentially can provide a bounded guarantee. So it may be feasible to explore all schedules that involve up to, say, three context switches. And if you can prove that there are no bugs up to this depth, that gives some confidence in the correctness of the concurrency test. And you might even argue that knowing that any bug would require more than three context switches gives you some feeling for the low probability of such a bug occurring in practice. So the idea um, of schedule binding, and there are two key methods, preemption binding and delay binding, which I'll come to in a minute, is as follows. So we would explore, in the space of all schedules, potentially all schedules involving zero preemptions. This may be a very small set. A superset will be all schedules involving up to one preemption or up to two preemptions. And in the limit, if we carried on exploring schedules with more and more preemptions, then we would, in theory, explore the whole space. So preemption binding, to, to my knowledge, was first proposed by Musavati and Kadir in PLDI 2007. And delay binding was proposed more recently by Michael Emi, Shaz Kadir, and Zvonimir Rakamaric in Popol 2011. So I'll talk a little bit about preemption binding and delay binding, and then I'll get on to the empirical study itself. So in this diagram, I'm illustrating the difference between a, um, a context switch that is forced versus unforced. So in red, a schedule has used zero preemptions, and in yellow, one preemption. So if you look here, thread one executes, and then thread one, thread two, and thread three are enabled. Okay? So if thread one continues to execute, there has been no preemption. So there's, there's not been an unforced context switch. However, if control switches to thread two or thread three, then there has been one preemption. So this schedule has cost one preemption. On the other hand, if thread one was blocked at this point, then it would cost no preemptions to switch to either thread two or thread three because there's no choice. It's not possible to continue execution of thread one. So these are unforced context switches. And if we look at this slightly more complicated example, we can see, for instance, here this, this red path is a schedule with zero preemptions. This yellow path or this yellow path are schedules with one preemption, and this, this path that ends up blue, there are two preemptions. Any questions regarding this? OK. Delay binding is, I guess, uh, slightly less, less obvious than preemption binding. Let me try and explain it. So the idea of delay binding, I'll give you the idea first, and then I will try to give you some intuition for, for why, it, why it can be useful. So the idea is to fix a deterministic scheduler. For example, a round-robin non-preemptive scheduler but it can be any deterministic scheduler. If you run a fixed input deterministic test case with such a scheduler, then there will be one schedule, right? Okay, so the idea of delay binding is that during systematic testing, we use this scheduler, but we can deviate from the schedule by skipping over a thread at the cost of one delay. And in the study, as in prior work on chess, we consider delay binding with respect to our non, no, a non-preemptive round-robin schedule. Okay, so let me try and illustrate further how delay binding works, and then I'll talk briefly about the intuition. So suppose we have four threads. Initially, only thread one is enabled, and we're using this round-robin scheduler. So thread one executes until it becomes blocked. So even if threads two, three, four become enabled, thread one carries on executing. If at some point thread one becomes blocked, then we go to thread two, Okay, if threads two and thread three become blocked, we go to four. If thread four and thread one become blocked, we go to two. So this is the round-robin scheduler. But to illustrate delay banding, at this point, suppose we've got the situation where thread, one, thread two is executing and it's enabled. Then at a cost of no delays, it can carry on executing. That's the default thing the scheduler would do. At a cost of one delay, we can skip to the next thread. So we do an unforced preemption to thread four. Note, we don't, it doesn't cost anything to skip over thread three because thread three is disabled. Okay, and at a cost of two delays, we would go to thread one and skip it and go onto thread, sorry, we would go to thread three and skip it and go onto thread one. Okay, 
So this illustrates zero, expending zero delays, one delay, and two delays. And here is the, the schedule tree. So suppose we've got to this point, having expended no delays, we can carry on having spent no delays by continuing with thread two, or we can switch to thread four at a cost of one delay, or thread one at a cost of two delays. So we now may consider any schedule that uses up to d delays for some small number d. So let me try to give you the intuition for why, why delay banding can be effective in practice. Um, I have to confess that I, I don't have a terribly strong intuition. I, our study confirms that it does work better than preemption banding. My intuition is not all that strong for why, so maybe Shaz can comment as well. But, but my intuition is that with um, preemption banding can be useful because it dramatically reduces the, the schedule space, but does consider the possibility where at some non-forced point a thread yields to another thread. The problem is with preemption burning, the thread yields to any other thread, and then you get this explosion of possible threads. But it doesn't seem necessary to consider all possible threads that could be yielded to. The key thing is to stop this thread executing and let someone else have a go. And with delay binding, we are deterministically picking who gets to go, uh, but not completely de deterministically, because we have this costly non-determinism. So if we want to de deviate quite far from the schedule, this costs something. Okay, so we're not going to, by default, consider, if, if we use a small delay band, we're not going to consider these rather costly sources of non-determinism. We're going to consider the, the cheapest, which is just to stay with the current thread, or something slightly more expensive, which is to skip on by one thread or two threads. Yeah, Tom. I, I thought the other intuition was uh, to deal with huge numbers of threads. So it, 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 this goes to the state space explosion. If I have a preemption where I have 100 enabled threads, right, then, then I have many, many choices about who right. comes next. And if most of those threads are symmetric, it, it sort so, of really doesn't matter. But, but with preemption bounding, I sort of treat them as, as if they're all unique. With delay bounding, I don't suffer that problem. So I think I can deal with huge numbers of threads. There'll just be some threads that don't get prompted. Right, I mean, absolutely the idea of the large number of threads leading to a schedule explosion and that going away with the delay banning, to me that completely makes sense. I guess the thing you're adding there is saying that if these threads are kind of roughly the same, there's nothing especially interesting about all of them, then it really would not be particularly effective to, to consider all these possibilities. Okay. Yeah, well, even if they're not symmetric though, I mean, if, if thread four can do something bad to thread one, it may not matter that thread two intervenes. In right, you're gonna get to thread four so. eventually. The key thing is getting away from thread one at a certain point right. and letting thread four do its bad thing. Yeah? OK. Yeah. I think this also can be a function of the density of the dependence relation. If the density, dependence relation is very sparse, like in message passing, where only certain wild card choices make a difference, that might be another knob to turn. OK. The examples where the dependency is very, very sparse, and they keep increasing the coupling. So you think that if there's sparse dependency, then delay banding is likely to work well? The outcome, it would be good to turn that knob also. Perhaps. Okay. Yep, sounds interesting. <coughs> so we can apply these methods iteratively. So the idea is rather than necessarily saying we're doing delay bounded search with a delay of three, we can actually just say we've got an hour or we've got 100,000 schedules and we're going to try all schedules with a delay of zero. And then if we manage to finish all of those, there will only be one of them, so we will. <laughs> then we will try all schedules with a delay of one. There'll be many more of those. All schedules with a delay of two, up to two, then all with a delay of up to three until we either exhaustively explore or we run out of time or we reach some, some um, agreed number of schedules. So I, I use iterative, IPD for iterative, iterative preemption bounding and IDB for iterative delay bounding. So the claims of prior work are as follows. A low schedule bound is effective at finding bugs. Then schedule bounding provides benefit over more naive systematic techniques like an, just a straightforward depth first search of all schedules. And that, that delay bounding is better than preemption bounding in the sense that it's faster at finding bugs because you, can, you have a smaller schedule space to search and you can find these bugs in that smaller space. So the, what, what we felt was that prior work is mainly from Microsoft and it uses a lot of non-public benchmarks. So the benchmarks sound very interesting, but they're, they're not publicly available. So but by and large, they're not publicly available. So it's hard to independently validate this research. And then there are all these papers about concurrency analysis which use they have these names of benchmarks you see cropping up again and again. So what we thought would be good would be to try to get all of these open source benchmarks and implement, re-implement the algorithms for delay binding and preemption binding and do a study to A, assess how effective these techniques are 
with respect to each other and with respect to na naive systematic search, and B, actually assess the benchmarks themselves. So these benchmarks that people are using, are they any good? Or, you know, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So the experimental method. Oh. Okay. So what we did was we took this tool called Maple, which is from researchers at the University of Michigan and at Intel. This was published at Oopsla 2012. And the actual paper about Maple is to do with coverage-guided hunting for concurrency bugs. And that's not really at all the focus of our study. But Maple was a suitable choice for us because it was independently implemented. So it's not something that we implemented. It supports systematic concurrency testing, and it's open source. So what we did was we took Maple, and we added support for delay bounding, and we um, studied, when I say we, I really mean Paul Thompson. He studied the source code of chess quite carefully and tried to make sure things were implemented similarly to, to chess. Um, and then we got hold of all of the buggy concurrency benchmarks that we could find from existing papers that are amenable to systematic concurrency testing. And in our paper, we go to some length to explain which benchmarks we had to exclude. For instance, there were quite a lot of benchmarks that involved GUIs, and that's very difficult to, to apply systematic concurrency testing to without doing quite some significant work. Tom? C programs? C++. Yeah, these are C++ programs. Yeah. C++ benchmarks. Okay. And, and the Maple 2 works using the PIN instrumentation framework. So these are com we compile these programs, and then we use binary instrumentation to, to do systematic testing. So, so you're saying uh, the point of Maple was to use some coverage techniques to try to guide which schedule to, to select next? Yes. So Maple does, um, Maple is non-systematic. So it controls the scheduler. But it uses heuristics to try and um, find, a, find a schedule that's likely to find bugs. Okay. okay. And that in our paper, because we could, we did actually compare oh, okay. with Maple. I'm not going to present th that data, though, because that's not, that wasn't our aim at yeah. all in the study. Yeah. Okay. So we found these 52 buggy benchmarks. I mean, there were many more benchmarks. And we whittled them down to 52, which were amenable to systematic concurrency testing with modest effort. And these are all public code bases, and we've, we've amalgamated them with the permission of the various authors, and we call this SCT Bench, Systematic Concurrency Testing Benchmarks, and this is a, now a publicly available benchmark suite. And what we did was we looked at three techniques initially, iterative preemption bounding, iterative delay bounding, and naive depth-first search. And we applied every technique to every benchmark, and we gave every technique 10,000 schedules in which to try to, to find a bug. We use schedules rather than time because we believe it's a future-proof metric. So we, running this kind of experiment takes serious time, and we had to do it on a cluster. And furthermore, we had to do it on a cluster where many benchmarks were running on the same node using multi-core capabilities. And then timing becomes difficult. Okay, but number of schedules doesn't become difficult. And if people want to compare with our techniques in future, they can compare based on the number of schedules, even if they don't use anything like the same hardware we're using. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering uh, why you didn't consider the concurrency fuzzing <coughs> approach as well. The concurrency fuzzing approach, yeah. because it's not systematic. So we wanted here to look at systematic methods, okay. stateless model checking. Okay. So there's, there's, also, uh, there's also a kind of combinatorial explosion of how many things you compare. So we, we, there are like various things we'd like to look at, like PCT, for example. But in, yeah, yeah. In, in this study, we, uh, you, know, you know what it's like. You get closer and closer to actually trying to submit a paper, and eventually you think, right, for this study, we're going to have to just rein things in a bit. And it sounds like you're just plugging that scheduler and yeah. just see what happens. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm, we're not finished with the study. We have a paper on the study, but we'd like to, we'd like to do more. I think the, the Sandfish's work, that's open source too. Yes. Right? So you could actually have this completely independent implementation of concurrency. The so Sandfish's work, is does, I don't think it does the systematic. No, it doesn't do systematic. But the oh, scheduler, the PCT you can, you can, schedule, you know, you can use it in a non-systematic oh, way right, or right. in a systematic yeah. way. I got so, you. I got you. Okay. But, so that's absolutely on our to-do list of things, uh, especially given um, I'm going to talk a bit about a random scheduler in a minute. And we're very keen to try PCT, given the results we have with the random scheduler. All right. So a quick word on data races. Over half of the benchmarks we found to contain data races by using a dynamic data race detector. These data races are found almost instantly by any of these methods. So if we treated data races as bugs, we really wouldn't be able to distinguish between the bug finding ability of these methods, because they would all just find a bug. Okay? And we had a look at some of the benchmarks. And in some cases, it's kind of clear that the developers would regard these races as benign. In other cases, it's 
things like incrementing a, a counter and histogram, which really should be done with a relaxed atomic in C++11. Um, in the end, what we decided to do, as has been done in prior work, was run dynamic race detection up front and find a load of data races. And then look at all of the instructions that participated in some data race, promote every one of those instructions to be a visible operation, so treat every one of those as a sync op, a sync op. <coughs> and, then, and then ignore the fact that there may be further data races and do systematic concurrency testing, scheduling at sync ops and known racy instructions. But every time those instructions are executed, whether or not it's a racy scenario, we consider them as sync ops. So this, this essentially explores sequentially consistent outcomes of those data races and is oblivious to, to future data races. So we argue that th this is, um, A, it's what has been done in some prior work, and B, it's, it's not biased towards any of the particular techniques we're evaluating. OK, so here are the names of the benchmarks. I won't spend too long on this slide, but you may, you may be familiar with some of these names. So AGET and PBZIP, I think, are very famous in papers about concurrency testing. Then we have this rather large set of examples, which come from the TACAS software verification competition. Let me emphasize here, we are just taking the benchmarks we can find and that people are using in their papers and people are boasting about. So here, for ex example, you can see that there are many variants of a, of a dining philosopher's <coughs> problem. So you, know, you may or may not think that that's good in a benchmark suite. But these are the benchmarks that we could find. Small. So programs. yeah, they, so what about the first you guys? Are they big or small? I, they, I mean, I'm not in, I'm not intimately familiar with the source code of these things, but I think that PBZIP is moderate sized. None of these are massive programs, or or some of them come from massive applications, but they're uh, sometimes I think it can be really misleading in these papers to say we tried this on SQL Lite, which is 200,000 lines of code, when actually the test is running on a hundred of those lines. So you know, then there are some some benchmarks from from chess, which Paul ported into to Linux. So the, these work stealing Q benchmarks, which we thought were very interesting, which were available. There are some Parsec benchmarks, some Radbench benchmarks, and some of the Splash benchmarks. And in each of these suites, there are, I think in all cases, there are more benchmarks than just these, but there were always examples that it would have been really quite difficult to make amenable to, to systematic concurrency testing. And there was only so much effort we could put in into, into curating this benchmark suite for the study. OK, so the top level Venn diagram of results is as follows. So we have 52 benchmarks. Seven of them, none of our techniques could find bugs in. So preemption binding, delay binding, or naive search. 33 of them, we could find bugs in. And in all of those cases, the bugs could be found by one of the bounding methods okay, within 10,000 schedules. So there's never a case where doing this naive depth first search was better in terms of bug finding on these benchmarks. And we can see here that delay bounding is significantly better than preemption bounding in, the, in that there are seven benchmarks where delay bounding was capable of finding the bug and preemption bounding was not. The seven benchmarks were none of the techniques. Do you know if there's a bug in there or no? All of these things have bugs. We, we know they all have bugs. So I'll come back to the, the bugs we couldn't find. We know anecdotally they have bugs. Right? Okay. Like people say there's a bug in this and they explain the bug in English. Okay. Right? Okay. So it could, be that they're, it could be that they're wrong and that, you know. It would be interesting to look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I will, I will come back to that. OK, so what this does is confirms two claims of prior work. So first of all, for this benchmark suite, supports the claim that ba schedule bounding is effective at finding bugs. And furthermore, it supports the claim that delay bounding is superior to, to preemption bounding for finding bugs. OK. But one of the reviewers of our PPOT paper suggested that it might be interesting just to try a, a, a completely random scheduler. So a scheduler which at every scheduling point randomly selects a thread. It doesn't use any PCT type stuff. It just randomly selects a thread. So we read that and to be honest we thought kind of grown, you know, I guess we should try that. But it's going to be some uh, more experiments to run. But we did it. Okay, this is the result. Right? So what we found was that the random scheduler, the completely naive random scheduler was able to find all except one of the bugs that could be found by the systematic methods. And furthermore, it could find an extra bug. And furthermore, which you can't see here, it found these bugs um, significantly faster in most cases than delay bounding. Of course, that could be due to luck in terms of the random schedules. So let me explain again about the random schedule that we're picking on the fly. We're making random choices. We're not recording those choices. So we could be doing the same schedule in this set of 10,000 schedules. So we would just do 10,000 random schedules and see how far we get. Okay. So we find this very surprising. And I guess if I'm completely bluntly honest, it, it suggests one of two things. It either suggests, or a mixture of these two things, it either suggests that SCT bench, this set of benchmarks which people are using and we gathered, 
is not representative of real-world bugs, or it suggests that actually these bounding methods don't provide benefit over just a naive random approach for, for raw bug finding. So I'll talk a little bit about how good this benchmark set is in a minute. But, but one thing uh, in defense of preemption binding and delay binding is, first of all, it's, uh, I think it's definitely true that if you, if you find a bug using a delay bound of one, it's likely that the counterexample you get is going to be much more palatable than the counterexample you get from some crazy random schedule. Okay? The second thing is that because these results support the hypothesis that bounding is useful, that adds weight to these sequentialization methods. So context bounding and certain forms of delay bounding admit sequentializations where you can take a concurrent program and you can rewrite it into a sequential program such that the sequential program exhibits all of the behaviors of the concurrent program up to some bound. And then you can use static verification methods from the sequential land to prove, not for just one input, but for all inputs, that this concurrent program is correct up to this bound. Now, how useful is such a claim? Well, it's potentially quite useful if it seems really to be true that you can find bugs in small bounds. So, so these results, I guess, add weight to that use of these bounding methods, even if they potentially detract from the use um, just for bug finding. Which compares pure random to the, the guided really does see a significant difference. But that's on substantially large real applications, right? right. Like SQL Server. You know, yeah. Because that technique is not systematic, it's able to run on very large programs. Yes. yes. That's just because we can run on large programs shouldn't prevent us from running even small programs. Oh, no, no, no. But what I'm saying is that, you know, I, I, think, I think these benchmarks. These benchmarks perhaps are winnowed down in such a way that you know your your schedule space is not that huge. So right. you're, you're, it's definitely true. It's not a needle in a haystack. So, it so, doesn't seem like a needle in a haystack if random's doing this well. Well, so yeah. I, in in a second, I just have, want to give one piece of intuition that I have for for this scenario. So it seems to me that if a bug can be exposed with just one preemption, then to me, there seem to be two extreme scenarios. One scenario is that the bug will occur if this preemption happens sometime. Right? Doesn't matter when, it just has to happen. And in that case, it seems that loads and loads and loads of schedules will expose the bug, and then random will find the bug. Right? On the other extreme, there's the case where some preemption has to happen, but at a really key point. And if it doesn't happen at that key point, you won't get the bug. And then that's, as you say, Tom, like searching for a needle in a haystack, and we wouldn't expect random to do well. Yeah, but the other thing you're not accounting for is random is finding the bugs in fewer guesses yes. than IDP. Right. So systematic is penalizing you. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You're just doing worse than around. So the only intuition I have there, this, this came from Hannah Chocler at King's College London, who saw Paul talking about this work, and she, I'll try and, I'll try and say what Paul told me she said to him, which is that <laughs> if you imagine the tree of schedules, then, then um, shallow terminal schedules are likely to be favored by random. Right. And if you have a bug that can crash the program very quickly, then it will have a shallow terminal schedule. And there may be a very high probability of, of it will, there, will, there will be a number of these shallow <laughs> terminal schedules, and you will have a high probability of hitting one of those. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, but, but the shallowness helps both, both methods. Except that we're doing, so when you, something I haven't mentioned in this talk, but is, is in the paper, is that we're doing IDB and IPB with, you have to pick a scheduling method underneath that, and we're using depth first search underneath IPB or IDB. That's, uh, that's mainly because in Maple, that was a pretty core engineering decision and was hard to reverse. So Maple is running, you know, you're running and you're recording your schedule, and then you're trying a schedule variant. And there are many ways to enumerate the schedule variants. And a simple way is depth first enumeration of schedule variants with a, a schedule bound of one, say. Okay? And that will not necessarily favor these shallow bugs. It, does that make sense? Uh, no, I guess I'm misunderstanding what you mean by, sh by shot. What, what do you mean by shallow? I guess if you imagine the space of all schedules as a tree, mm -hmm. then I'm shallow would mean terminal schedules which are not very uh, deep in the tree. But it means few preemptions? It means few instructions executed, full stop. Oh, okay. Yeah. So why does the number of instructions executed matter? Because if you imagine the random scheduler, every time it reaches a sync copy, it makes a decision. And if there are loads and loads of shallow terminal schedules that end with a crash, then if it makes random decisions, it's quite likely to get to one of those, rather than if there's a very, very, very deep crash. Yeah? Deep meaning, but deep would mean 
terms of number of scheduling decisions, not in terms of number of instructions. We're just counting schedules. We're not counting uh, instructions. I wonder if we might be able to talk about it after, because I, I would like to, it's something I, I uh, haven't thought about that much and would like to think about more. And, yeah. Because it seems like what you're doing, what's happening here is our IDB is doing something systematically bad, right? It's going off on some piece of the search space where the solution isn't. Right. You know, whereas apparently the, 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 the space of solutions is quite dense and you'll find one quickly if you, if you get random. It, it, does, it does seem that way. We can, we can look at the, the big table. So this is the big table. I mean, we're not going to look at it now, but this, this table has all the data in it, right? And so, you know, it, we, we included this in the paper because there were only so many observations we could make ourselves and fit in, and this, this has really got a lot of information. So if you're interested, we could offline maybe pour over the table and look at some of the results. Uh, we're very curious to understand this. We were very surprised by this, right? And we're very grateful to the reviewer, if you're watching, for suggesting we, we do this. And, and unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to have our comments about the random schedule appear reviewed because we put these in the final version of the paper. Ganesh. Yeah, I actually, Ching Sung and I ran an experiment when I was visiting Intel uh, for a year. We took Murphy and uh, used parallel random walk, basically used different seeds. Okay. And we put hit boxes really, really fast. Right. We didn't record the trace, that was the problem. <laughs> okay, you didn't record the trace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it was random walk. And then the other thing is we also did a count of how many variants of the same error there are, because we don't care. So each error occurs 10,000 or 8,000 times in the state space. So. So yep. you don't need to hit that certain instance mm. because the door care is populated all over the state space. So random is not random. When you say random, I presume you say pseudo random. You could, you could reconstruct yes. the bug if you that's, that's pseudo random. Show somebody how it misbehaves. Yeah. Right. right, but I think we should focus now on the benchmarks and their limitations because let's not get too carried away because some of these benchmarks are not good. So, um, so but but the main findings then I think I've covered these. So um, schedule binding similar schedule binding was similar in terms of bug finding ability to random search. Many bugs can be found with a small uh, bound, delayed by the beats preemption binding. But what I want to talk about now is that a significant number of the benchmarks may be regarded as trivial in some sense. And I think this is quite important because if benchmarks are trivial, researchers should not boast about finding bugs in them. Right? They should become a minimum baseline. If your tool can't find these bugs, your tool is, is not a tool. And you need to boast about finding you know, better bugs than these bugs. So I hope that our study can potentially set a, a, a clear baseline for, for at least systematic concurrency testing techniques, <coughs> maybe concurrency testing techniques in general. So if you have these big table of benchmarks, if you have all of these um, benchmarks, which I'm not going to allude to by name here, but the, um, yeah, well, let's see. So trivial benchmarks. So here's a property. Bug was found with delay bound 0, 14 benchmarks. Right? So what this means is the single, the single schedule with the delay bound of 0 found the bug. These should be just stricken. Right. Okay. But, the, but let me emphasize again, we just wanted to take the benchmarks people are using and study them, right? OK. Um, the numbers here, there is overlap between the numbers. This isn't a partitioning of the benchmarks. There were 16 benchmarks where, Tom, you were, you're correct to say that the schedule space is not vast. So there were fewer than 10,000 terminal schedules overall. Forget bounding. I mean, and what, what this means is that all of the methods we studied would eventually find a, the bug because they would all exhaust the search space, right? So then it might be that um, delay binding would get there faster or preemption binding would get there faster. Maybe, maybe not, but every technique would get there. We found in 19 cases that more than 50% of the random schedules we tried exposed a bug. <laughs> now, of course, that could be, could be luck, but I think it suggests that there are loads and loads of schedules that expose a bug in these benchmarks. Okay? And then furthermore, of those, nine of them, every random schedule we tried were, was buggy. Okay? And then... And then, in the, and then in these nine, the the right, and then in these nine, I, I, think I would have to check the exact number, but I think four or five of them, every schedule we tried with every technique hit a bug. <laughs> so going back to my, the beginning of my talk, we would not actually call those concurrency bugs because they are not schedule dependent. Right? So um, we, include the, we included them in the study because they are claimed to be concurrency bugs by. So I think the same is true for the not necessarily. That is, schedule. No, that's a little bit better because it depends on which scheduler you chose. I mean, yeah. it's a little weird because that's like the default scheduler. That's the thing that would happen pretty much on, a, on an ordinary computer. <laughs> and and I'm, sure it's, I, I'm sure it's another case because we didn't find, otherwise we would have found this for all 14 and we, we didn't find this. Uh, I'm saying uh, there's another one which we don't have a column for, which is every schedule was buggy and we didn't find that for 14. Definitely not. Right, so. Just to give, just to give you know, anecdotes, I mean, on the benchmarks we were doing with chess, which were the ones I worked on for.NET from library code, I mean, 
for small, for small like things like hash table, and, you know, a parallel hash table. I mean, we, I mean, we would have you know millions of schedules, right? I mean, we would, I mean, I mean, just small programs. We would just, and this is with all the bounding and everything. We, yeah, we had yeah. huge numbers. So, the, so, so first of all, just the, I mean, ten thousand. Let me ask you, were they all buggy? So all of these benchmarks are buggy, right? Yeah. You found bugs, but what all of them? No, Dom is saying that. I'm just saying the search space. That's the search space is ridiculously small for well, currency. So, so let me emphasize, though, I'm not saying that. So what we're saying is that there were 16 cases where you had the small search space, right? Mm -hmm. For everything else, there were 52 benchmarks. So for the, the remaining benchmarks, we don't know how big the search space was, but it was more than 10,000. Mm -hmm. And you know that it's not going to be, it's probably not going to be 10,002. It's probably going to be bigger. You know how big those things really are. Yeah. Um, because. I mean, with chess, definitely we had experience of exhausting the, for a preemption bound of two or three, and uh, you know we have examples. You know, you can make up whatever number you want, but but I mean, for the real things, you know, we would just we would just we could keep exploring for a very long time <coughs> on relatively small but complex complex codes. So, okay, so I mean, because it's, these these were things you know with volatiles and with uh, interlocked operations, and the code was small, but Schedule space was, was huge. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's like pretty clear from these results that the, I mean, the, I'm focusing here on okay. the ones we say are trivial. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then there are the rest of them, some of which come from chess and which are harder. And, you know, I'll come back in a, in a minute to some of those. But it sounds anecdotally that you pro your, your um, reading of these results is probably that when I said that, you know, we, we draw one of two conclusions, right? Either these benchmarks are not realistic or these methods are not providing benefit. So it sounds like you, you're probably thinking the first. Which, which I would like to think, because I find these bounding methods fascinating. I'd like to study them more. <laughs> to me, it was a mess, of, in a way, a bit of a disappointment when we found this random result, because I kind of thought, what are we doing then if we can just find these bugs randomly? So, you know, I, um, I think the key thing is the difference between bugs that just, you know, programs that are just very likely to crash, and then you probably don't, you know, you could argue that maybe you don't need systematic testing. Maybe the program is so likely to crash that. Another approach is to say maybe random testing also can be improved. Yeah. Maybe you can do better than the random scheduler using mm -hmm. random methods. Yeah. I mean, PCD so, scheduler. I mean, it's all a matter of searching. You search a schedule space. Yeah. How do you want to search that space? You can do DFS, you can do BFS, you can do probabilistic search. And probabilistic search is random testing. And then you can ask the question, how do I want to guide my search? Right. I think it might be useful to qualify the benchmarks using qualitative approach which would say this is a clearly a synthetic benchmark created by hand to insert a bug into a well-known but small concurrent program and try to find it. I mean versus you know a benchmark that comes from the wild which is you know typically what we were going after. Yeah. With chess. I mean clearly everybody creates synthetic benchmarks. Uh, we create them basically as functional tests to say is the tool just working? Is, yeah. Does it find mm -hmm. a bug or not? And, and to also do unit testing, which is an interesting <coughs> thing for, for exponential yeah. search space, but to have really tiny programs that have a small search space so that the tool can, uh, we can, we can test the tool. Very test quickly. the tool, right. So what we wanted to do in this study, like I said, was yeah. just take what, take what there is yep. and evaluate it and do it quantitatively. Yeah. We didn't want to, we wanted to be very objective here. But I think given some of the findings, I think maybe, uh, you know, some more reading of the code could be in order. So I'll talk briefly about the bugs not found. And um, so, so there, were, there were three bugs which were not found in a rather trivial way. These bugs could be exposed if you reduce the number of threads. So you saw in the list, of, I think this, this is these dining philosophers examples where there's two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I think it's the case, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's that in dining philosophers seven, you couldn't find the bug, but it's basically the same bug as in dining philosophers two. So I don't really regard those as particularly interesting unfound bugs, except that maybe delay binding should find them if delay binding is meant to be good with large thread counts. Maybe, okay. Um, then there's this Radbench bug, number one. So this is a JavaScript interpreter, and th this is, uh, we have a scenario where thread one destroys a hash table, thread two must <laughs> access the hash table, and Paul believes that this should be exposable with only one delay, but there are upwards of 14,000 scheduling points. In, he looked at an execution, um, and he looked at the number of scheduling points in that terminal execution, and there were you know, upwards of 14,000 of them. So you can see that there would be a very large Other schedule space. No technique was able to ever yeah, find them. Yeah, no technique was able to find them. Right? And the, uh, the, the RAPEDGE bug 2, we know requires at least three delays or preemptions. 
because I believe we were able to search this one exhaustively. We need to double check the table. Okay. But we didn't find any. We were able to search it exhaustively up to this band of three. And then you found it. Uh, sorry, what, um, what I mean, sorry, no, 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 sorry, that's not true. No, we didn't find this bug, and what we did was we explored 0, 1, and 2, and we got into 3 when we reached the 10,000 limit. So we know that we would need at least three preemptions to find this bug. Okay. Yeah. Have you looked at the bug death metric that you define in the PCD paper? No. Because it sounds like you're actually going after something similar here, uh, you know, figuring out how many... Uh, scheduling points and how many preemptions. So, so we have this classification of bug death on a similar idea, except it's priority lowering points. It's not preemptions. Okay. It, it boils down to a similar thing. And is it possible to use that metric to assess a case where you didn't find the bug, or can you only use it when you found the bug? Um, or can you use it as a to give you a lower it's bound on? Hard to actually measure this because it states what is the minimum number that you need to find. To be guaranteed to find it, I see. Sort of quantified over all possible scales. Okay. Might be hard. But no, we didn't, we didn't look at that. And I, I, I didn't remember that from my reading of the paper, so I'll need to go back and study the paper. All right, and then there's um, an int a very interesting benchmark, which we, which we classify as miscellaneous. So this comes from um, Dmitry Vyukov, and this is posted to the chess forum. This is a stack, a lock-free stack. There are three threads, and, and the poster of this, of this benchmark claims that this bug could only be exposed with at least five preemptions, and there are 114 checking points. Right? So this, if, if he is correct, and we, you know, we couldn't find this bug, so it's, I can't say you know, we validated this. Well, we, explained this he's explained the bug in English, right? So his claim is that this bug cannot be, man, cannot be exposed with a small number of preemptions. So that is, uh, ah, obviously there will exist kind of counterexamples to this claim of, but you, you may still regard five as a small bound, but this is a, a not so small bound. So it would be interesting to see whether, whether PCT could find this. And we didn't find this with random. And this sounds like the, the sort of thing we wouldn't find with random, right? Because it requires five preemptions. Random is not going to, you know, the, ch the chances of just naive random inserting those preemptions in the right place is very small. Something which I won't talk about now, but which we... But how long did you run uh, the, the bound was always 10,000. Always 10,000. Right. So, I mean, what Zvonimir suggested to, to Paul at PPOP was, why don't you, you know, take that benchmark and just run it for 10 weeks or something. So I find it's hard to imagine that a real program needs five preemptions to hit the bar. Like, clearly you can craft any program right. to need that many. But if, I mean, I would be interested to, I mean, it's probably terrible to look at, so maybe not, but, but it's you, really hard to believe that. Do, and the author uh, says that he crafted this to have, uh, to be, uh, have uh, this five preemption uh, Lower bound, or this or some, like, discovered natural. this by accident? I, could, I, I haven't personally looked at this. I could click the link now and we can look. Yeah, yeah. true. This goes back a long time. Go to uh, chess.codeplex.com. Oh, there it is, okay. Gosh, I can't believe that's still alive. <laughs> in what sense, in that you no think it's bogus? or? We haven't looked at that we forum should, in a while. This forum a long time ago. Oh, the forum, <laughs> I see. Uh, maybe people just link the forum, not the actual bug. Okay, I don't think I'm going to be able to find this during the talk, but let's, let's look at it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Right, so the, so now I get back to systematic concurrency testing full stop. The, the main problem we had doing this study was environment modeling. So GUI applications, applications that use processes, not threads, and use the network. And um, what Paul tried to do was to take those applications and then extract from them isolated concurrency tests. So try to take out something that involves a few threads in a scenario and use that for, for scenario testing. But he found often there would be global variables, and this would be very hard to do. So it would not be looking at these more real world things. It would it'd be very difficult to extract these test cases. So I think for people to really use systematic concurrency testing, they need to be willing to put some effort into writing concurrency unit tests and trying to you know, make these tests stand alone so that, you know, so that you can systematically explore the schedules. Then an another issue was that many of the bugs we found were related to memory safety, but what we had to do was actually knowing from reports on these bugs that there's a problem with memory safety, 
we had to then add an assertion at the point where we know the problem is, and then see whether we could find that assertion. What we don't have inside Maple is good, dynamic, Valgrind style memory analysis to try to find these bugs. But there's a, right. you see programs typically crash, right, with a sec fault or something? O often not. I mean, if there's a buffer okay. overrun, it often doesn't crash. So, you know, you, and, and whether that happens may be non deterministic. So, the, there's a kind of challenge of, engineering challenge of trying to do, you know, if you want to do, if you want to do race detection, maybe to do full exploration of all schedules arising from data traces, you need very fast on the fly race detection. If you want to find these memory errors, you need very fast on the fly memory analysis. And, and getting all those things integrated into a tool and then having the flexibility to be able to explore these scheduling strategies is, qu is quite some engineering challenge. But not, but not really a research I, challenge. I comment about the second issue. Yeah. At the start of the chess project, the, there are two challenges with this kind of testing. One of them is, of course, creating the isolated unit test. And the second one is this combinatorial explosion. And I think that at the start of the project, it was not clear to me that there are two very distinct challenges. And I think uh, I found, you know, talking to engineers and testers in the company that oftentimes the reason for doing random testing, they, they, they think that they are doing random testing because of one reason, but it's really because of the other reason. You mean because they can't isolate these? Because they can't isolate it. So they just A lot of the reason why the testing is, concurrency testing is not principled is because uh, you can't isolate, isolate these tests. Even what you call random scheduling, right? Yeah you are able to build a truly random scheduler only once you have gotten full control over all right. the so scheduling it's, it's choices. Con yeah, it's control. But if you, look, if you go into the industry, what people refer to as random scheduling just means that they're just running the test again yeah. and again and yeah. trying to perturb yeah. things, right? And that's absolutely not what we did here. And so if you do this, I mean, what we're doing is already way more principled. And what I'm saying is it's way more principled than what, what is happening yeah. in, in, in an actual uh, product setting. But harder to apply. But there is a smooth transition, right? So you can have the perfectly isolated test where you run a random scheduler. Then you have a test in the real scenario where you can maybe you're not catching every single piece of synchronization. <coughs> you have you have still have some idea that whatever worked well in the isolated case is probably also going to do better if you only have partially preemptions. So I mean the same scheduling decisions you can make in the purely isolated case for random scheduling. Uh, have a good chance of working once you apply them to the real uh, code, even if you don't catch all the synchronization. But but is it how do you apply them to the real code? How do you just apply them? You can always intercept some synchronization. You just can't you can't restart the program every right. time you want to restart, and you, you have no guarantee that you won't miss some some synchronization, or maybe sometimes you guess incorrectly that the thread is blocked and it's really just slow. So those are like imprecision uh, approximations that you have to do in the in the real code. So that's what we do in cars, right? Right. So, um, but modulo those guesses where you're incorrect, you're still running a principal scheduler. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Right. So to conclude with the slide on future work, so what we'd like to do, I mean, Paul has a bunch of ideas related to. <coughs> extensions of systematic concurrency testing and heuristics. But in terms of this study, we would like to look at more techniques. So yes, the, the PCT technique, I think, is, is primary on the list. But then it would be interesting to compare with non-systematic techniques as well. We would like to, now we have this framework for running these tests, we would like to really extend the benchmark suite significantly. We didn't look here at partial order reduction. The reason is that it's not trivial to combine partial order, order reduction soundly with these bounding techniques. In, soundly in the sense that I, I would say that POR is combined soundly with delay bounding, for instance, if you don't lose anything additional to what you're already losing with delay bounding by applying POR. And my understanding is that that is not the case if you naively combine them and that it's an open problem on which people are working. I think Madame Musabati had a paper with Catherine Coons and Catherine McKinley at, at Uppsala um, last year on precisely this topic. So that's something we would like to look at. And then there's this issue of weak memory in systematic concurrency testing where, where I understand there's been some preliminary work, but we would like to explore that further as well. Okay, so thank you for listening, and thanks for all the questions, and I'd be delighted to answer any more questions. More questions? Yeah. Sure. So there would be other possibilities for, for random. I mean, instead of just doing you know, complete random scheduling, you could do you know, random delay. 
or something like that. Mm -hmm. a random perturbation from a fixed schedule. So Shaz, you told me that you had, you said something a bit like that to me, that you've even tried delay binding with a different schedule. Right. With a randomized, but yes. deterministically random schedule, yeah. as in you so, pick the seed at the beginning, right. and then you have a, now a deterministic scheduler, but it's like a randomly chosen deterministic scheduler. Yeah? Yeah, you could do that. I, I was thinking just as a, as a bias in your, in your random schedule, right? Mm -hmm. You could say, you know, bias towards round robin. Okay. You know, and that would put you a little closer <coughs> to the, you know, the delay bounding you know, ideal. And yeah. so would that work better than, you know, unbiased round? Um, given that delay bounding does seem to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, over, yeah, that's an, an interesting idea. And I think it relates a little bit to PCT, right? Which isn't favoring round robin, but is prioritizing threads and randomly changing priorities. The idea behind PCT is to find the randomization that gets as quick as to the shallowest bugs. Right? So we have this characterization of death. And the thing that we found we want to randomize is priorities and priority lowering points. So we give all threads an initial random priority, and then the schedule is deterministic based on that priority. And then there are like random points in the execution where we lower some the priority of some thread randomly. And that's it. Okay. So you, you had a question in the back? Yeah, there's one, uh, one famous concurrency bug, which was when the space shuttle had to be scrubbed on the launch pad. Did, did, you, add, did you try to add it to your list? <laughs> we, didn't try, we didn't try to add that to our list. I don't know whether it's a C++ program with a fixed input. and Yeah. Uh, but no, we didn't. Ganesh. I was wondering whether you could take advantage of the code structure. Some of the initialization code may not be of interest, so you may want to get past it and then turn on the search and mm. things like that. Yeah, yeah. So start the search at certain depths. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, you may want to. I mean, run the application up to some point, I suppose, and then take maybe take a snapshot of that point, and then do systematic concurrency thing from the snapshot. Yeah. So I, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Yeah, sure. So when you were introducing. Delay bounding, you mentioned that delay bounding is with respect to a uh, round robin scheduler. Well, I said in general it's with respect to a deterministic scheduler, and right. in, so, this, in this implementation, like chess, we use round right. robin. Yeah. So the, the result of doing delay bounding uh, varies a lot depending on what uh, deterministic scheduler you used. Because as Ken was saying, the the deterministic scheduler is sort of like the point around which you are biasing the search. Yeah. So in other applications, so I'm interested in testing, systematic testing of message passing mm. applications. For those applications, there is no such notion of preemption on context switch. Um, you have processes running and they're communicating via message passing. So there is no a prior reason to believe that uh, um, uh, preemption among those processes is particularly going to be useful. And we found that, uh, and so we, we were using the idea of a deterministic <coughs> scheduler, right? Because that's a very general concept that doesn't depend on whether you're running on a single process, single single core or a multi-core. It, it is applicable even to a distributed system. And we found that the uh, speed with which bugs are uncovered depends significantly on the particular deterministic scheduler Okay. that we started with. So we experimented with the round robin scheduler that yep. you mentioned, and uh, there's another one called run to completion right. uh, scheduler. Uh, there was one more called, uh, so we created a random delaying scheduler okay. also. And is that akin, but that's not akin to our random sh scheduler, is it? No, 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 no. So no. did you try random scheduling like we tried? Uh, we have not tried random scheduling. You should scheduling. try that. I mean, so we should try it's easy that. to try. Yeah. I guess what surprised me a bit was that in prior work, there was not our comparison with this very naive random approach. It, it didn't surprise me actually because we didn't think of doing it either. It was this review who suggested we try it, right? So I guess m kind of the, my takeaway from this work is definitely try all these easy things, right? You know, they, it's good to try them. No, you shouldn't but try them. They're embarrassing. Don't try them because they mean you can't publish your paper anymore. <laughs> is that what you mean? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and, and I, think with, I think with this benchmark set, my reading of it is that about half the benchmarks I think are nonsense benchmarks. I think about, uh, uh, a fifth of the benchmarks are really hard and we can't find the bugs. And I think the remaining are interesting benchmarks. And for those benchmarks, um, I think we're seeing you know, the claims of prior work being supported, but this random approach is, is doing well. And you know, maybe those bugs are not super hard to find, but the benchmarks are not super simple either. I think it's also like if you say 
random or non random observer for what Charles had and also what, what we knew but didn't really point out is that it's not really that much of a, a difference between you know randomized search and non randomized search. If you think of the random the number of random choices as an input to like picking a schedule, right? So you can just pick those random choices before you start, right? And that would be similar to um, you can de you can deterministically enumerate all random choices, and then you have a systematic right. search. Right. So you system. Okay. So, so if you know that there are hundred scheduling points, you yeah. systematically enumerate. Yes. All and then the you know the design of a good random scheduler is to pick few random choices. It's <coughs> just like when you determine the complexity of randomized algorithm. You know, it costs something to to pick a random bit. So you want a scheduler that uses as few random choices as possible, and that same scheduler then is actually good for systematic exploration because you can actually go through all the random choices. Okay, I'd like to talk more about that. Yeah. Okay, more questions? All right. Thanks.